Hello, and welcome to the annual video series from the International Symposium on Human Identification. Today, we have Kelly Harkins Kincaid joining us. Kelly, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Great, thanks for having me. It's great to be here virtually. Um, I am the CEO of a, a new startup called Astrea Forensics. We're about a year old. And what we do is provide a service for law enforcement and related you know, law enforcement agencies where we provide uh, whole genome sequencing data from degraded samples for the purposes of investigative genetic genealogy. Uh, so this was a sort of a born out of our work collectively, myself and the founder uh, out of the ancient DNA sort of research world. And we found a, a really good foothold here and thought it would be a very useful service um, to provide and so far so good. So uh, thanks for, I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit about it. No, we are so happy to he have you. Um, I know you're doing some really interesting things. Maybe first tell us a little bit more about how Estrella got started. What was the genesis? Yeah, so I'll go back just a few years um, for myself and, and then also talk a little bit about Ed Green um, just very briefly. So my background is in paleogenomics and my research is focused on getting minuscule pathogen DNA, reconstructing pathogen DNA out of archaeological human remains. So my background is very much um, what would be called paleogenomics or archaeological genetics. So I'm very used to dealing with samples that are uh, at baseline degraded and then attempting to get something even smaller um, out of them. And so most of my sort of research questions are very anthropological in nature, uh, understanding like disease, disease transmission and origins in prehistoric populations. But when I began a postdoc uh, at the University of, Santa, of California, Santa Cruz, uh, in the UCSC paleogenomics lab, I got really drawn in by methods development. So it sort of put, brought me on a different kind of path. And uh, Ed and I had been working on some methods that we thought would be really useful for samples other than ancient DNA. And we spun up a company actually called Claret Bioscience um, in 2017. So I've been leading that I established that lab and built that facility and leading a team of about eight or nine folks there uh, when, when our technology started to be used for a different purpose, which is forensics. So the technology we offer is this you know, great way of getting really degraded DNA out of samples and getting it sequenced. And folks started to uh, reach out to Ed Green who's still faculty at the university, even though he's founder of these companies, uh, reach out to him and say, hey, I have these really terrible samples or I, I'm working with hair and I, I've heard that, you know, there's ancient DNA techniques that work really well for hair. Can you help me in, this, in these cases? And so on campus, on his lab on campus, uh, he, he, all of a sudden he had all of this interest from totally different, you know, part of the, of the community um, meanwhile, down the hill, uh, I was already working in a commercial sort of lab with Ed. So it, and given my, you know, ancient DNA background, it just was a really nice melding of our experiences and um, the kind of infrastructure we already, already had established and my, uh, you know, ability to kind of set up a lab very quickly and get it running. So that's, that's how it started. It was a long answer to the question. No, that's, that's amazing. It's, you've been a little bit busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that it's is, growing. So, I mean, it's, it's great. So let's talk more about the degraded samples. Um, you know, how do you work with them? What are some of the benefits, challenges? Yeah, so uh, one of the sample types that we um, kind of excel at and is one of our more unique capabilities is working with rootless hair strands. Of course, we can work with bone and, and teeth um, as well. We tend to apply ancient DNA techniques to them. So techniques that are designed to get the shortest possible DNA fragments out of a sample. Um, the benefits of using something like hair versus bone and teeth is that 
you know, samples, human remains often uptake um, organisms from the environment in which they're buried. Um, so, and because they're, they're kind of a porous substrate, whereas hair kind of tends to uh, not be as permeable to microorganism contamination. So when you get a bone or a tooth and you get all the DNA pieces out of it that you can and sequence them, sometimes 99% of those DNA fragments aren't from the human themselves. And but this is very different in hair. Um, there are cases where hair is just extraordinarily preserved over so we've actually tested some things in the ancient DNA world with uh, like woolly mammoth and woolly rhino. These are extinct animals that have been around for, you know, have been extinct for 50,000 years. And the DNA degradation in the hair strands is at 50,000 years ago, the same kind of degradation in the hair that's on your head right now. That's amazing. That's incredible. So, yeah, applying sort of the ancient techniques um, and then uh, performing whole genome sequencing is, is you know, a, kind of the paleogenomic pathway, but if we apply it to these other samples, it, it turns out pretty, pretty well. It is amazing what you're doing with hair. That was a, and that was a great illustration of what it is, you know, for anybody who's watching this who hasn't worked with that before. We certainly have a lot of people from the Ishii Conference who um, are um, expert in some of these things, but then we have a lot of people who are just interested in the field or thinking mm -hmm. about it. So it's fantastic. Maybe we can talk a little bit about mixture deconvolution too. I think you're working with that. Yeah. Actually, there's, there's one other point I'd like to make about sure. hair before we move on, because it occurs to me, like you said, there's a lot of folks who um, have been in the, in the field of forensics for a long time and have not formerly worked with hair. And sort of the question is, why not? And the traditional methods, um, you know, the thing about hair is that the hair on your head right now, as I just said, gets degraded almost immediately. Once it's degraded, it kind of maintains over time, which is kind of one of the benefits of that type of sample. But it degrades so short that the DNA pieces are too short for STR profiling or any PCR-based approach because the amplicons that those methods are trying to target are just longer than there are pieces of DNA in, this, in the hair strand. So for a long time, it was maybe thought that there's not a lot of nuclear DNA present it's not that it's not present, it's too short to be observed by those methodologies. So for all intents and purposes, it wasn't there. It wasn't observable and it wasn't useful to anyone. So once you have a method where all of a sudden getting a 30 base pair DNA fragment and getting millions of them over the whole length of the genome, once you have a method that can do that, then you can sort of reconstruct um, you know, a lot of the genomic information. So I just wanted to point that out because a lot of folks are wondering, well, how, how is it that you're getting nuclear DNA from hair? And it's, it's certainly in there. Uh, you just have to use a different method to, to, to get it, it out. And we do use published methods for the DNA extractions and the library preparation. Um, so, uh, you know, th those are, those are available um, online and what, what, what kind of methods we use. Thank you. That is, um, it's amazing how far that we've come and how many things that we can put together now to do different techniques. It's incredible. Yeah, like a big yeah. puzzle. Yeah. Yes, a puzzle. That's a perfect way to say it. <laughs> All right. Um, let's well, talk for the convolutions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry for <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was, that's very good. The more, the better. <laughs> so uh, one problem that uh, we are kind of addressing, we think is a really interesting, difficult, very difficult problem is when you have a sample that is, a con you know, has multiple contributors. Um, so the beauty of hair is that it's a single biological unit. We only ever process one hair at a time and can only have come from one individual. So that's, that's really nice, but that's not often, I mean, there are many cases where you're gonna get, get a sample who that might have multiple contributors. So right now we're working on a method. Um, we've been working on it all year. It's a computational method and it's um, 
you know, right now we're only working with two um, individual con co contributors. The idea of being able to use population genetics as sort of a framework for separating those two individuals, but not just separating them, actually providing an entire genotype file for, um, for the unknown component. So assuming that maybe in a situation where one component is a known victim and one component is an unknown person, the idea would, is um, generating the entire genotype file. So that file then gets treated like any other genealogy-based um, uh, output. Um, and so we think that, that when we're through the R&D phase of that, we think that'll be really exciting and, and valuable. That's incredible. It's, yes. Um, how about ancient DNA? You touched on it, but let's talk a little bit more about the work you're doing there. Yeah. So the, you know, ha having a relationship with the university and the paleogenomics lab that obviously still is, is churning out really interesting stuff all the time. Um, we, we have a, a great relationship where we can kind of go back and forth on methods development a little bit with them um, and have the benefit of being able to access some of the samples that they uh, maybe have some excess of where we can play around with methods development. For example, like I mentioned, the ancient mammoth and the ancient rhino. So these um, help us to, to really make sure that our, our uh, methods are robust. And we've learned a lot, of course, about, about how DNA degrades ju just by understanding samples from all kinds of time periods, from all kinds of organisms. Um, I mean, my, I think the oldest humans that I, I've worked with are about 10,000 uh, years old, all the way up through um, the, the modern time periods. Um, but with, when you're using kind of extinct animals, you get to go even further back. And so it allows you to sort of understand DNA degradation rates and kind of what happens um, when, when something, something um, called post-mortem damage, what features of DNA get changed uh, when damage occurs in the molecules. Um, this actually happens kind of immediately the, in your body when your DNA gets damaged. You have biological machinery that just goes in and fixes it. And the moment that you no longer cease to live, all that biological machinery is done. And so that's how DNA degrades from, you know, start, starts to degrade from the moment that you die until, you know, however long. So we've kind of been able to use ancient DNA as a, as a learning tool. Of course, the methodologies that come out of ancient DNA um, are so useful for forensic samples. Uh, we use... Um, we use kind of the, the methods that are meant to get DNA from things that are, you know, in, in some cases, even hundreds of thousands of years old. So when I moved from ancient DNA into this forensics context, I was like, oh, these, these samples, no problem. <laughs> I mean, certainly there are, there are some exceptions. There are always samples that, that give you trouble, but um, it's, it's kind of, it, it's a nice way to apply a research-based strategy to something that really matters in the real world. And uh, I've felt really at home uh, since starting this company. I think that's, a, that's amazing. And what a progression. I mean, taking those techniques from the ancient DNA. I know talking with Ed, uh, we spoke to him three years ago when he was working on the Neanderthal genome, genome yeah. and projects there. So yeah, the history that you both have in this company, is fantastic. Yeah. What's yeah, that for you? What yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. Uh, what's next on your radar? What are you working on now? That's a good question because the other side of the company, which is um, developing the same techniques that we apply in the forensics context, we're applying those to clinical samples. There are a lot of clinical samples that kind of mimic, have some of the same characteristics of, of a ancient or degraded sample. And so we're trying to find kind of different applications for these same techniques. You know, the ancient DNA world um, has, has all of these great methodologies that turn, it, turn out to be useful across many, many different uh, sample types. So 
we're working on some clinical stuff. Um, we're even working on, on, in the other side of the lab, some of the um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, enrichment. So that goes back to the, you, you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, a little virus part, you know, part of the genome in a, in a mixture of things that are um, not, you know, that, that are human. Um, so, but in the ancient, uh, I mean, in the forensics lab, we're, we're hoping to just get the word out there. And, um, you know, we've realized that hair is often collected in different cases, even though that it might not be the first sample type that a crime lab decides to go after. So we're hoping to just um, make this service as, a, as, uh, as broadly useful as possible to as many folks as possible. We think it's a, a great uh, use of the technology and then um, we'll work towards accreditation. Right now we are you know, a research lab, we're very young. Uh, so we have terms and conditions that try to follow closely with the DOJ guidelines for the use of this data for forensic gene genetic genealogy. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can kind of grow past that as the grow with the field as the field grows and be kind of there on the, on the forefront. Well, I feel like we'll definitely want an update next year and keep <laughs> to keep following this. I think it's going to yeah. be fantastic. Yeah. Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you for working through our uh, first ever virtual interviews this year. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure.